Amen. Hey, put your hands together if you are thankful for the blood of Christ today. Amen. Hey, grab your Bibles if you would and go with me to uh, Luke, Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, while you're turning there, let me tell you a little story. Um, uh, there's a girl named Michelle. Michelle was my first love. And um, Michelle was my first love. Uh, Adrian is my last love. And uh, she is the, the love that's forever now. But Michelle was my first love. And I, I was, I was uh, wanting to tell Michelle uh, how I felt about her. And, uh, and so I, I, I decided to. And what I did was I grabbed the my best piece of paper I have. I grabbed uh, a pen. And to the best of my ability, I tapped into the inner poet that is inside of all of us. And uh, I wrote what I believe could have been on any Hallmark card. And I wrote this phrase, I like you, do you like me? <laughs> and wait for it. And then I put yes and no, and then I put a circle with an arrow. How many of y'all have written that letter before? Anybody here? All right, so kindergarten, that's when I wrote this to Michelle, all right? That love lasted about a week, right? And it was a long-term relationship for me. Uh, so kindergarten, I wrote that. And here, here's what I remember about that. I remember for the first time having anxiety over how does she feel about me? Like wondering, how is she gonna respond? Is she gonna circle yes or is she gonna circle no? How does she feel about me? And I remember just the angst of, of sliding that to her desk at school and then just waiting for that response. And, um, and here, here's why I bring that up. I, I think that so many people um, live life with this type of angst in regards to their relationship with God. That there are so many people who are really fundamentally asking this question, how does God feel about me? Like, does God love me? Does he not love me? Have I done enough for him to love me? Have I done so much that he can't love me? And there's, there's for, for many of us, an unsettledness, and I think because of our religious culture, oftentimes the way we answer that is, is really based upon whether we consider ourselves a good person or a bad person. And we live kind of in a religious culture where everything is measured by the, the, the naughty and nice list. If I, if I, have I done enough? Have I not done enough? And here's what I wanna talk about this morning. This, this idea of how does God feel about me? And does he love me? And how do I know he loves me? And, and, and am I good enough to receive his love or have I done too many bad things that I can't receive his love? Luke chapter 15 is where we're going to be and Jesus is gonna help us understand this. We're gonna start reading in verse number one. If you're there, say, I'm there. Here's what the story tells us. It says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. This phrase, tax collectors and sinners, is a category that was often used in, in Jesus's day to just put people who were outside of a relationship with God, outside of the religious sect. So these were the, considered the bad people. They were the people that God, was, they would considered, wouldn't have a relationship with them. So that's what he's talking about. He says, the tax collectors and the sinners were drawing near to him, which I think is interesting that when Jesus, God in flesh, was on the earth, that sinners wanted to draw near to him. There was something about Jesus that was attractive, which for us in the room who are believers, the question we need to ask ourselves is, are we enough like Jesus that lost people wanna be around us? I think that's, that's not the sermon, but that's a great question we should be wrestling with, right? And here's what happens next. It says, they were drawing near to him in verse two, and the Pharisees and the scribes, this is in a completely different group of people. This was the most religious people. These are the people that everybody believed they have a relationship with God because they're good. They're righteous, they're religious. They're the people that when you think of who's going to heaven, their names would come up on the list. So the other group is the scribes and the Pharisees. It says they were grumbling, and here's what they were saying. This man, referring to Jesus, receives sinners and eats with them. Here's the dilemma that was taking place in the story, is that, that here Jesus is, Jesus is claiming not to be a prophet, to be the prophet, the Messiah, God with skin on, on planet earth. And here is God in the flesh, or a, a prophet, and, or the prophet that, that God was sending to show us how to know him, to usher in his kingdom. And yet, Jesus is breaking all of the religious and cultural rules. That here Jesus is, this, 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 the prophet from God, the Messiah, and he's hanging out with people that no one in the religious world would hang out with. And here is the great dilemma. This is why there was, this was such a problem. And this is why the Pharisees and the religious leaders were grumbling. is because the common thought of the day is really the common thought of today. 
which is this, God is drawn to good people and he rejects bad people. That if you're not good enough, he doesn't want anything to do with you, that he doesn't love you and he doesn't want a relationship with you unless you can become good. But if you are good and you are religious and you are moral, then he wants a relationship with you. And so what you find is, is that Jesus is doing just the opposite of the cultural norm. Here it is, God in the flesh, he's drawing near to people that they said God doesn't want anything to do with. In fact, Jesus doesn't hang out with the people that they believed God wanted to have a relationship with. He's flipped the whole thing on its head. And here they are and they're frustrated. They're going, if he's really from God and God was really the one who sent him, God would never associate with tax collectors and sinners. And the tax collectors and sinners, I believe in that day, would probably agree with it. Most of them lived their life on the fringe of religion thinking I will never be good enough to have a relationship with God. Always living with this great fear is I, I can never do enough to be like the religious people and therefore God doesn't want a relationship with me. And I think that's why Jesus was so attractive to these uh, sinners because for the first time in their life, a man who was from God was saying, I came to know you. And this creates this dilemma of who is it that, that Jesus came for and, and, and who is it that is able to have a relationship with God? Is it the good people? that we have to be good to have a relationship with him? Or is there maybe moments in our life where we're so bad that we can't have a relationship with God unless we become a good person? And this is what Jesus is gonna settle for us this morning. Uh, Jesus responds to them by telling them three parables. Parables are just a story that Jesus is telling in order to give a spiritual truth. And he tells three, we're gonna focus on the very last one. But here's the truth. I wanna give you one statement that gives you really two truths that, that I want us to kind of build everything on that we're gonna learn in this third parable. So if you're taking notes, write this down. Here's what we're gonna see. Listen to this, and this, I love this truth. Here's what Jesus is gonna show us. No one is so far gone that they are out of the reach of grace. Anybody thankful for that? Yeah. No one is so far gone that they're out of the reach of grace and no one is so good that they're not in need of grace. And this is the lesson that we're gonna learn from Jesus this morning. No one is so far gone that they're out of the reach of God's grace and no one is so good that they're not in need of God's grace. Jesus is gonna dismantle this myth or this misconception that God is drawn to good people, but he rejects bad people because here's what we're gonna discover. There is no such thing as a good person. That all of us fundamentally are sinful and broken in need of grace, regardless of whether you are religious or irreligious. This is gonna be the point of the story. So we're gonna pick up in um, chapter, 11, or chapter 15, verse 11. Now here's what we're gonna discover in the story. I want you to remember there are three groups of people in verses one and two. You have uh, the sinners and the tax collectors. That's group of people number one. You have the Pharisees and the scribes. That's group number two. And then you have Jesus, who is God, God's representation on, on, on earth. And so in this parable, you're gonna see three characters emerge that represent the three characters of verses one and two. Nod your head if you're with me. So you're gonna see there's gonna be a younger son. The younger son represents the sinners and the tax collectors from verses one and two. You're gonna see an older son. He represents the scribes and the Pharisees of verses one and two. And then you're gonna see a father. And he represents what Jesus came to bring in verses one and two. And so I want you to see those characters as we work through the story. Let's look at the first character. Here's what we're gonna see. We're gonna see the reckless life of the younger son. The reckless life of the younger son. Look what happens in the passage. Verse 11, it says, and he said, and that's Jesus telling the story, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country. And he squandered his property in reckless living. The word reckless here is where we get the word prodigal. The word prodigal does not mean wayward. It means reckless. It means wasteful. That's the idea here. And by the way, I'm gonna just tell you one thing I didn't tell you a second ago. Uh, we, we read this story and we oftentimes talk about this as the prodigal son. This is the way we, we refer to this story. But really, the story is not centering on the lostness of the son, but the gracious love of the father. That's the point of the story. But right now, Jesus is showing us the sinful condition, the reckless life of the younger son. And this is, in essence, what is happening here. This younger son comes to his father and he does something that breaks every cultural norm of that community of the day. 
This, this, this boy comes to his father and says, dad, basically, I wish you were dead. And say, so how do we know that? Because he says to him, hey, listen, when you're dead and gone, you're gonna divide up the state between me and my older brother. Here's what I want. Let's pretend like you're dead now and just give me what's coming to me when you're dead. So in this particular day, this would have been so shameful and disgraceful for any son to make this kind of a demanding request of their father to say, I don't care about a relationship with you. I don't want, I don't want you. I want your stuff. So go ahead and give it to me and I'll be done with you. This is, in essence, what's happening in the story. And then it says that he left his father's home a few days later after the father gave him the estate, and he just left, it says, to a far country. The picture that Jesus is painting here is the absolute rebellion of this son. In other words, he goes to his father and says, I don't want a relationship with you, I just want your stuff. And once he got the stuff, he left the home and went to a faraway country. What Jesus is implying here is that this boy is leaving his community, and his religion and the rules of his father and he's doing his own thing. Faraway country would have implied he's going to Gentile territory, people who are outside of relationship with God. So think about this for a moment. This, this boy is saying to his father, I wish you were dead, give me your stuff. I'm tired of your rules. I don't want a relationship with you and I'm walking away from your religion. Jesus is doing this, I believe, because everyone hearing this would have been shocked at this young boy and the story that Jesus is telling. Immediately, they would have understood this boy deserves death. He deserves to be stoned. He deserves at very least to be excommunicated from the family, never return again because of the shame and the reproach that he would have brought upon his father and the family. I mean, this should have been game over. And Jesus is showing us that this boy has completely rebelled and he's abandoned everything that his father stands for. It says that he wastes his life on reckless living, on prodigal living, wasteful living. The thing is, understand, we understand something about sin that Jesus wants us to see. This, this boy basically is saying, no relationship, no religion, no rules, life on my own terms. This is why he left home. I was right here just for a second. You know that fundamentally that's what sin is. Sin is us saying to God, I want life on my terms. I appreciate the air in my lungs. I appreciate the heart that's beating. I appreciate the life in my body. I appreciate the sunshine and all the things that you've created, but I don't want the creator. I just want the creation. So just let me have my life. I'm going to go live my life independently of who you are. That is what sin is fundamentally. It is saying, I want to establish life on my own outside of relationship with God. It's, it's saying, God, I'm gonna define what's right for me and what's wrong for me and how I live and where I go and what I do. And here's the thing, we're all guilty of this, are we not? You see, sin is anything that's outside of God's nature and the boundaries that he has set for us as his creation. And Jesus is showing us an earthly picture of a spiritual reality of the condition of humanity we, we have, have been born now with this sin nature that says to our creator, I don't want you, I want your stuff. I don't want your rules. I wanna determine life on my own. I don't care about a relationship. I just want to do what's best for me. And that's the disposition of all humanity toward God. Sin is this kind of rebellion. I want you to see what this leads to. Look what happens next in verse number 14, this type of reckless life, this kind of sinful life. Look at verse 14. It says, and when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out uh, as one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate and no one gave him anything. So the story starts off by this boy getting everything that he ever wanted. No rules, no relationship, no religion. I'm gonna party it up, live on my own, life on my own terms. And eventually the party came to an end. And he finds himself in a broken place. And Jesus is showing us just how far he's fallen. So think about this. He has now rebelled against his father, shamed him in front of the entire community. I wish you were dead. I'm leaving the family faith. I'm gonna go live among the Gentiles. And now that he is at rock bottom, he goes so far as to now hire himself out to be a servant to the Gentiles where he is gonna feed pigs. And that particular day, Jesus chose this on purpose. 
because this was considered the most unclean animal and no respected Jew would have anything to do with a pig. And here's what you find. This boy is at such a rock bottom that not only is he serving the pigs, he's eating with the pigs. I think when Jesus says this in this moment, everybody in the crowd would have gasped and have been appalled. And that was the point Jesus was trying to make. He has hit rock bottom. He has lost everything. He has tried to pursue life on his own terms only to find himself wanting and lacking. And here's the second truth about sin I want you to hear. Not only is sin establishing independence and a life on our own terms, listen to this, don't miss this. Eyes right here for a second. Sin always overpromises and underdelivers. Sin always overpromises and underdelivers. You see, sin comes to us and it says, listen, if you'll just establish life on your terms and if you'll just do what you want, you'll be happier. Life will have more meaning. You'll have more joy. Life is gonna be amazing. You just choose what you want. Do what makes you happy. This is what culture says to us, is it not? You do you. But you just be who you wanna be. Go do what you wanna do. Whatever makes you happy, that's what you need to do. And so there is this promise of life being found and, and by our own terms only for there to be a bait and switch. And at the end of it, sin over promises and it under delivers. This boy had all these ambitions when he left. Man, I'm gonna live it up. I'm gonna party and I'm gonna have all of this joy and, and life is gonna be full and I'm gonna take this money and have friends and make more money. All of a sudden, he finds himself in a place he never imagined he would be. Because sin never tells you the aftermath of sin. It only points you to the momentary pleasures. This is why the writer of Hebrews, when it's talking about Moses, it says that Moses refused to be the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Rather, he chose to be rejected with the people of God. Why? Because he knew that sin had pleasure, but pleasure has a life shelf, has a shelf life. And then it has an expiration date and it's gonna come to an end. And this is what this boy is discovering and this is what we need to discover. You see, sin has a way of bringing us in, promising something greater and something better, only to leave us empty and broken. This is the picture that Jesus is painting. You see, here's what happens is that sin eventually runs its course. It promises pleasure and it brings pain. It promises freedom and it brings bondage. It promises satisfaction and leaves us empty. It promises us life and ultimately it leads us to death. It always overpromises and it always underdelivers. And if you, you don't believe this, I mean, just look at social media and watch television for eight minutes. I mean, you see story after story after story of celebrities and people who have reached the pinnacle of the American dream. They got the house, they got the car, they got the spouse, they've got the career, they, everybody knows them. And if you watch their story long enough, eventually there is gonna be a bottom to it all. And it's gonna lead them into paths of multiple broken marriages and, and, and finance uh, that, that fails them and, and drug abuse that leads them into addiction and all kinds of devastation. Why? Because it promises, hey, you'll find life and it only gives death in return. I mean, we all know people like this who they, they just seem there for a while. I mean, they, they had life together. I'm gonna do life my way. And if you watch them long enough, it might be a year, two years, a decade, two decades, three decades, eventually, listen, they will come to the bottom. And sin would have made them a promise that it couldn't deliver on. For some of you in this room, that's your story. You see, you thought if you married the right person, that would make you whole. You thought if you could may have had the popularity and, and people know you and you've, you've accomplished that and, and you're still finding yourself empty. Some of you are like, I get the house and the neighborhood and the cars and I mean, if I can get in this circle of people, if I can just live life for my own pleasures and have all kinds of vacations and recreation and here's what is the story is being unfolded time and time and time again is I got it and it wasn't enough. And it only led me to deeper pain, deeper problems, deeper bondage and less happiness. And see, a lot of the things that we're turning to aren't necessarily sinful in and of themselves, but we use them in a sinful way when we turn the creation into the creator. 
And we try to find in the creation what we were only meant to find in the creator. And that's what's happening in this boy's life. I I love what happens next. That's not the end of the story. Verse 17, check this out. It says, but when he came to himself, this is the turn of the story. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here in hunger. I will arise and I will go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. Listen, how many of y'all have ever done something to your mom and dad, like you, you knew you blew it and you knew you had to go and tell them and so you rehearsed the story, you rehearsed the, the way you were gonna approach it. Anybody ever do that? Come on now, some of y'all are lying in this house right now. <laughs> I, I remember as a kid, like it seemed like every week I was doing that. Here's what I'm gonna say. And you rehearse it. That's what's happening right here. It says he came to himself. I love that because literally what it's saying is he woke up. He left the house believing he was gonna be able to live it up and have a full life only to find himself feeding the pigs and hungry and desperate and broken. And it says that he came to himself. He had a moment of epiphany. He realized something about himself. He realized, man, here I am and I'm trying to eat the food of pigs. And then he began to remember what it was like at home. And I love this because this is a point of humility for him. He recognizes he's unworthy to be considered a son in his home. But he he says this, he says, but at least the servants in my father's house have food to eat. You see, there's this realization that life did not turn out the way that he had hoped and what he really needed all along was found in the very place that he left. His heart is beginning to turn back home where he belongs. And you can see this humility here. The humility is this, is that I, I don't even care if, God, if my father reinstates me to be his son. If I could just be a, a servant for my father, man, I would have everything that I ever needed in life because what I need most is to be home. And you see this great humility because he begins to make a plan to go home. You say, why is that so significant? You see in the story, he says, I mean, my my father's servants have this bread, so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna go to my father. I'm gonna tell him, Father, I'm not, not worthy to become your son again, but make me a servant and I'll serve you all of my days. I just wanna be back home. Now check this out. When this boy, if he does go through with this plan to go back home, do you know the shame he's gonna go through? Do you know the embarrassment he's gonna have to face? He's gonna have to walk through the very streets that he walked out of and everyone knows his story and here he is in the foul stench of the pigsty in rags. He's been living as a servant and he's gonna be walking back and everyone is gonna know that he didn't make it. Everyone's gonna know the condition that he's in. And he runs the risk of even being rejected by his father. He doesn't know this father's gonna embrace him or not. You see, why is this so significant? It's because what you're seeing in this story is the difference between remorse and repentance. You see, remorse is when you are broken and you don't like where you are, but all you want is for the circumstances to be fixed. And we're still gonna cover up and we're still gonna pretend and we're still gonna try to clean it up on our own. That's remorse. Remorse is when we get caught. Remorse is when we're broken. Remorse is when we get to that place and we don't like where we are and we just feel bad about it and we want circumstances to change. But repentance, when that takes place in our life, what happens is is that you don't care who knows. You don't care what shame, you don't care the guilt, you don't care even if you get rejected. All you know is I can't stay here, I gotta go back home. And so many of us in our life, we, we, we really, we, we think somewhere along the way that our remorse and we, we got better and we cleaned up and we got out of the pigsty and life got a little better but we never went home. Only to find ourselves in the pig pen again. See, when repentance sets in, you don't care who knows. You don't, you don't, the shame doesn't even bother you. All you know is I need my father and I need to be home and whatever it takes, I'm going home. I don't care who knows and who sees, I'm going home. 
And that's what you find in this boy's life. You see, this is a great act of humility. No one can come without humility. And I love the way this story is unfolding. Jesus is, is, is telling, he, he, he went away and then it just so happened that while he was living this reckless life that a famine came to the land. Why was that so significant? It's because the famine is what drove him to rock bottom. Do you realize that for some of you in this room, the famine seasons of your life, those seasons of brokenness, that was the grace of God trying to get you to the end of yourself. See, the worst thing God could do is to leave you in the mire and muck of your sin and not recognize you're in the mire and muck of sin. But in his grace and mercy, he sends famines into our life to bring us home. And, and then it says that he came to himself. I think this is what Jesus is highlighting for us is the, the, the conviction of the Holy Spirit that says this is what you need. Look at where you are. And so what you see in this story that even in the depths of his sin, you see the love of the heavenly father calling him back home. I love this. Now I want you to see, you see the reckless life of the younger son. Look at the relentless love of the father. And this is the point of the story. The relentless love of the father. I love verse 20. It says, and he arose, this is the boy. He arose and he's gonna follow through this plan. And he came to his father. Listen to the language. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and he felt compassion and he ran and he embraced him and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Remember the rehearsed speech? And he's in the middle of giving the speech, but the father doesn't even let him finish. Verse 22, the father interrupts this great speech he's been memorizing and says, but the father said to his servants, hey, quickly, go get the best robes and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And hey, bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. Why? For this son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found and they began to celebrate. This is beautiful here. What you find in the story is that when he turned to come home, he discovered that the father had been looking for him. That the father had been longing for him. Did you see the story here? It says, and when he came to his father and his father seeing him a long way off. You see, Jesus tells three parables here after verse two. And in all three of these parables, it is about something lost and, and that thing that's lost is loved. And so the person that loves it pursues it and seeks it. And so when it says, and the father saw him a long way off, could it be that every single morning this father would get off the porch and he would walk down to the edge of his property, looking down to the street saying, maybe today is the day that my boy's coming home. Every time a messenger came to the family farm, maybe today is the day that my son is gonna return and every day, day after day after day, we don't know how long he was gone, but this father is longing for his son, looking for his son. And then one day, lo and behold, there he is. He sees a silhouette and he recognizes the walk. That's my boy. And the scripture says a couple of things, details that we cannot miss. It says that when he saw him, he felt compassion for him. The word compassion there literally means gut-wrenching. It was like he was squeezed on the inside, all the emotion. Just think about this for a moment. I heard a story uh, about a man. He was a pastor and his son ran away from home and they lived on the outskirts of New York and his son was like 14 or 15 and ran away from home and, and they knew he fled to the streets of New York and so they were just worried. Here this boy is, doesn't really know anybody in a very dangerous area and so he called a buddy, they prayed and they drove into New York and they divided up and they kind of thought of where, where might he go? And this father tells the story that when his friend ran into one of the coffee shops, there was the son sitting there and he only sent the father one phrase, I found him. That father said, I've never heard three sweeter words in all of my life, I found him. Why? Because a father's love. 
His father felt compassion, gut-wrenching compassion. Then it says he ran to him. Jesus is using this because this was breaking another cultural norm. No respected Jewish man would ever run. To run means he would have had to have lifted up his robe, exposing his legs. This would have brought great shame and reproach. Everyone would have thought, this man is so undignified. What in the world could be so important that he was exposed himself in this way? But it says that he does it and he runs toward his son. And when he grabs his son, it says he wraps him up. The word that's used there, is this idea of wrapping up. Think about a big bear hug. He wraps him up and he pulls him in and it says he kissed him. In the original language, the implication is he kissed him and kept on kissing him. And I'm sure tears flowing down his face and here he is. Now just think about this for a minute. This boy of his has just got out of the pigsty. He is, has the foul odor of the pig pen, the rags of a servant, but the father doesn't care. He just embraces him. But why? Because his son is home finally. No respect, respected Jewish man would have ran, would have embraced his son like this and would have kissed his son like this. Jesus is showing us that this father is breaking all of the social and cultural norms. He is becoming undignified and bringing shame and reproach upon himself. But the father doesn't care. This is the relentless love. And in fact, there, there are some theologians who would say this, they would, they would not call this story the prodigal son, they would call it the prodigal father. Because prodigal means reckless. And in the behavior of the father in this moment is a reckless love. It's a love that says, I don't care what the expectations are. My son is home. I don't care what the culture says I should do and not do in this position. My son is home. I don't care what people think about the love that I'm giving my son. All I know is my son was dead and now he is alive. And this is the point that Jesus is making. Remember verse one and two, the people were indignant because how in the world, because God loved a sinner and a tax collector. And Jesus is in essence saying, I have come to break all of the rules. I have come to show a relentless, reckless love because that's the kind of love that God the Father has for humanity. And see, the story that we see here unfolding, this is the gospel story. Look at what he says here. It says not only did he run to him and embrace him and kiss him, it says that immediately he says, hey, go get the best robe. Question, who do you think in that house owned the best robe? The Father did. Go get my robe and put it on his back. Go get the ring. What was the ring? The ring was the signet family ring. With that ring came the authority of the family. Go get sandals for his feet. Why? Servants don't wear shoes in the house, but sons do. This is the gospel, is it not? This father breaking all the rules, being undignified, being put himself out there for shame and reproach, all to restore his son. And this is the beautiful picture of what Christ has done for us. You see, Jesus in the flesh came to live the life we couldn't live. In order to go to the death, we deserve to die. And on the cross of Jesus, Jesus bore the weight and the penalty of our sin. He became guilty even though he was innocent. He was put to shame even though he was holy. The scripture says that cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. And here it is, God in the flesh, on a cross, being undignified, being reproached, and shame placed upon him and the guilt of humanity so that you and I might be restored. And you know what he does? When we by faith respond to him, he puts the best robe on our back. He clothes us in the righteousness of his son, Jesus. He puts the Holy Spirit in us, the ring saying that we belong. And he puts shoes on our feet saying, you are sons and daughters. This is the love of God for us. This is what is waiting for those who will come home, who will recognize where they are. But there's also an older brother, an older son. So you see the reckless life of the younger son, the relentless love of the father, and then you see the religious life of the older son. Look what happens in verse 25. It says, now his older son was in the field and as he came and he drew near to the house, he heard the music and the dancing. And he called one of the servants and he asked what these things meant. 
So he's like, man, what's this, this party going on? What's going on? Listen to the servant. And he said to him, your brother has come home. Your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. So you even see the servant in the home going, you won't believe this. Your younger brother, he's back and he's well and he's good. And your dad's throwing a party to celebrate his return. So the servant is thinking the older brother's gonna celebrate with everyone else, but that's not what happens. It says this in verse 28, but he was angry and he refused to go in. Now I want you to put that in your back pocket, all right? We're gonna come back to that. So his father came out to entreat him. Now that, put it in the other back pocket. We're gonna come back to that. And he answered his father, Look, these many years, I, I, have, I, have, I have served you and I've never disobeyed your command and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, won't even call him his brother, who has devoured the property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him? And he said to him, son, you, you were always with me and all, all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and he's found. And I want you to see something in here that I think we often miss. You see, the Pharisees and the scribes would have known exactly what Jesus is doing here. They would have recognized, and everyone listening to this, that Jesus is referring to them as the older brother. And in the way that he unpacks the circumstances of the older brother, the reason I had you put those two statements in the back pocket is because of this. It's because when you look at the stories, here's what you discover. You discover that the younger brother and the older brother are actually in the same place in regards to their father. It just looks a little different. You see, the younger brother took the money from his father and he left because he didn't want a relationship with his father and he wanted to live life on his own terms. So he left home to pursue what he wanted to pursue because all he cared about was daddy's stuff. The older brother never left home, but from the language here, here's what you understand. And what you find here is, is that he refused to go in the house. So now you got both brothers at some point are outside the house of fellowship with their father. And then the older brother looks at the dad and says, all these years I've been serving you, all these years I've been working for you, I've been a slave to you, I've done everything you want me to do, and you've not even given a goat to me to celebrate with my friends. Here's what you discover is not only is he not in the house, all he wants is daddy's stuff as well. You see, it's the same story, just fleshed out differently. One son rebels with wild living. The other son rebels with religious activity so that he would be able to say to his father, you owe me. Neither one of the boys want relationship. Neither one of the boys are in fellowship. And the only difference between the two brothers at this point is that one is broken, the other one is not. Remember the truth we gave you at the very beginning? No one is so bad or too far gone that they're the reach of God's grace and no one is so good that they're not in need of God's grace. And, and so you see this, he's outside the house, but here's the other thing I had you put in your back pocket. But notice the love of the father, the relentless love. It says that the father went out to him. The father recognizes that one of his sons are missing. And just like he looked for the younger son, he is now looking for the older son. And he comes out and he says, son, why don't you come in and party with us? And, and this exchange is inviting you back into relationship. Come and celebrate. We have to celebrate your brother. And then the story ends with the older brother not coming into the house. Say, so why would Jesus just end the parable there? Because I think he's trying to tell the Pharisees and scribes, I came for you too. Will you come into the house? Will you come and hang out? And he leaves it open-ended. Here's the reality for some of you in this room this morning. Some of you, you are the older brother. You believe your relationship with God is real and vibrant because you look at all the things you do for him. If you were to be asked if you're going to heaven when you die, if you have a relationship with God, you would say yes, and then you would point to all of the good things that you do and the good person that you are as your reasoning for believing you're in relationship with God. 
You would point to your religious activity. And here's the thing, here's what I want you to know. If that is where your hope is resting, you are outside the house and you need to come home. And the Father has come this morning looking for you. You see, here's, here's the truth for my own life. What I've discovered in my own life is that, and some of y'all don't know my story, and I, I think it's good for you to know your pastor's story. In my life, I've been both the older brother and the younger brother. I've been both the older son and the younger son. I, I, was, I had the privilege of growing up in a Christian home. Mom and dad got saved at a very young age, when I was very young, rather. Um, and so I really never remember my life outside of church. I mean, we just, we went to church and Bible was something we believed and, you know, there's a certain way of life that we lived and, and that's just who we were. Life wasn't perfect, but man, we were very faithful to the house of the Lord. And, and so knowing the gospel is something, man, I could tell you frontwards and backwards. I would, man, I could tell you scriptures that I've memorized. So I grew up very religious. I even had some experiences of, man, of EBS walking the aisle and getting baptized. But the truth is, is that as I grew up, I, I began to believe that I had a relationship with God based upon my goodness or the goodness of my mom and dad. I found myself getting close to the teen years and there were questions that I would have in my own heart of, do I really have a relationship with God? Because I do notice that there's a difference between people who really know him and, and really where, where I was. But I kept telling myself, you're good. Your mom plays piano for the church. Your, your dad is, is always you know, serving and involved. Your family is, is a staple in the church. Of course you're getting it. And I was really good at, at comparing myself to other people. And then as I got into the teen years, conviction of the fact that I didn't really have a relationship with God became very real in my life. And in my pride, I just continued to go, man, if anybody's getting in, it's me. Look at my mom and dad, look at our family, look at the faithfulness. And then I learned how to play the game really well. I knew there were a lot of sins in secret, that as long as they remained in secret and I could wear the religious exterior, that could lead people to believe I was somebody I was not. And late at night, the Holy Spirit, would say to me, you don't belong to Jesus. I wasn't certain of my relationship with Christ. And I would just tell myself, do more, try harder. And then it got to the place where I had played the game so long. I like leader in the youth group, leader, I was in a private school, leader in the private school, 14, 15 years old. I knew how to play the game. And then at that point, the fear set in of, I can't tell people I'm really lost because I played the game so long. Because now if I, I'm exposed, like I'm the one doing the Bible study. I'm the one volunteering. Like there's no way I could tell the church that I'm not a Christian, I have to play the game. I was the older brother. But what happened is, is that as I said no, to the Holy Spirit, I slowly became the younger brother. I looked like the older brother, but I began to get in relationships that I didn't belong in. And between my uh, age of 15 and almost 17, I just began to lay, live a life far from God. I was trying to find satisfaction. I was empty and I was miserable. And I was trying to find satisfaction in what I accomplished in sports, I was trying to find my identity and fitting in with certain friends. I began to pursue relationships that were very unhealthy, making a lot of bad decisions in those relationships. And I was miserable and I was empty, but I, I just had to play the game because everybody thought I was, I was good. Everybody thought I was the older brother. And it is exhausting living a double life. I would go to bed at night. I mean, I'm telling you every single night and I would lay there and wonder what's gonna happen to me when I die. And I knew the answer. I'd never trusted Christ. I just felt so trapped. I'm like, I can't say anything now, but I'm dying on the inside. I mean, I was in a slow fade and I was moving further and further away from the Lord in deeper and deeper sin. 
And I remember telling God this, here's what I would tell him. There'll be a day, there'll be a day. I didn't know when, I was thinking maybe when I got in college or out of college or got settled in with the family, I'll, I'll turn my life over to you then. When I get outside of here where people don't know me, then I can get things right. My pride was just getting in the way. And then in mid-October, I was on my way home with our school from a flag football tournament. We stopped at the gas station where we stop at and my girlfriend at the time came over to me and she said, did you hear the news? I said, no, what news? I could tell she was upset. And she said, um, Michael's dead. Michael was one of my best friends. Grew up next to each other. His brother Brad was in my class. He graduated ahead of me. We grew up like family, vacation together, lived next door all of our life. I didn't know it, but the night before Michael had been on the same stretch of road that we were on and he was coming home and apparently some kid leaving a party crossed over in his lane and struck Michael's car and killed him and another friend of ours named Dan. That'll get your attention. And for the first time in my life, the brevity of my life became a reality. All this time of going, I'll take care of this one day, all of a sudden, one day didn't look very hopeful. And I'll never forget that night, I went home. I was broken over two things. One, I lost my friend. Number two, I knew because of my condition, I would never see him again. Because he knew the Lord and I didn't. It's embarrassing to say this. We, you know, as almost 17 years old, I felt I was a pretty tough guy living life on my own terms. My mom was at the family's house staying with them a few nights because we were so close. She was just caring for this mom and dad who just lost their son. I was terrified. So imagine a nearly 17-year-old kid getting up in the middle of the night, crawling to bed with my dad because I didn't want to be alone. And I laid in bed and I cried all night long. The thoughts in my mind were, what about you? Later that week, we did the funeral. And that Friday night, I was already planning out to be out with some friends, doing some things I shouldn't do. I hadn't planned set. But instead, I went to a revival meeting. Sitting in the section like right here, can't tell you anything the pastor said. All I remembered in that moment was the Holy Spirit calling my name like he had done for three years. I can't tell you what the sermon was. All I know is I can still remember that day. It was like I heard the gospel for the very first time. And I had heard it a million times, I felt like. I grabbed the front of that pew and I was holding on for dear life. And the Holy Spirit said to me very clearly, I'm calling you again. What more is it gonna take? And I sensed in that moment, I don't know whether this is the case or not. I sensed in that moment that if I did not respond in that moment, he would never call my name again. And I'll never forget it. My father was over on this section in the church and he was praying and I believe he was praying for me. And all of those years, man, I played the game. I can't tell people I'm not a Christian, but in that moment, I didn't care. 
Like when I couldn't, I was like in my mind, I was like, just stop preaching. I'm ready to give my life to Jesus. And I didn't care who saw, what they thought. All I knew is I had to come home. I was tired and exhausted and I wanted to know that I knew Christ. I needed my sins forgiven. I needed to know that I belonged to him and I didn't care who saw what they thought. All I know is I needed to leave that place and get on my knees beside my father and I cried out to the Lord and I said, God, I'm a sinner and I'm tired of running from you and if you'll have me, I give my life to you and I've never been the same since. I didn't stop sinning that day, but my relationship with sin changed immediately. And I tell you this to say, some of you in the room this morning, it's time to come home. Some of you are the older brother and you've trusted in your religion for far too long. And when you hear the gospel, you just, you you know that's what you need, but you have played so long that you are so worried. But when repentance comes, you will not care. You will trade religion in for a relationship. Others of you, you think you are too far gone and you gotta clean yourself up. I want you to notice that father wrapped his arms around his son in the foul stench of the pigsty. It was after he was accepted that he said, get the robe. I'm gonna put some new clothes on you. In other words, you don't have to clean yourself up. He'll do it for you. You just come as you are. In the last four days, I have witnessed two men in their mid-70s come to faith in Christ. Who said, I don't care, I'm tired. I believe God wants to do that with many more of you in the room today. I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads. There are some of you in the room this morning and you are the younger son. You've tried everything in this world to find satisfaction, wholeness, but you've never trusted in Christ and it's time to come home. You don't have to clean yourself up. You just need to come and know that your heavenly father is gonna wrap you up and he's gonna put a new robe on your shoulders. He's gonna put a ring on your finger and shoes on your feet. There are some of you, you're outside the house and you're the older brother and you need to trade religion in for a relationship with your heavenly father today. So right now where you are, regardless of who which you are in the story. I want you just to pray a simple prayer in your own words. This is not a magic phrase that you just repeat because I said it, but it's the heart cry of your life. So in your own words, just say something like this. God, I I know that I am a sinner and I need Jesus. I wanna come home. I believe that Jesus died and he resurrected. And I want you to come and live inside of me and be my Lord. God, I don't care who sees me and who knows about it. I just want you. I just want to come home. This morning, if you prayed that prayer with me or you want to pray to receive Christ, I'm going to get you to do something very bold. I'm going to In a moment, I'm gonna have you stand. No one looking around, but I'm gonna have you stand just as a a declaration of I'm coming home and I don't care who knows. Listen, I know for some of you, it's gonna take so much courage. Our last service, we had one of the most faithful deacons in our church stand to his feet, gave his life to Jesus. That takes courage. So if you're in this room right now, I know for some of you, you're trying to fight everything you can. Just get out of here. Praise Jesus. I want you to stand to your feet. If you, right now, if you prayed that prayer with me and you, you're done, you want Jesus, stand to your feet. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. All over this room, today's the day. Today is the 
saying, I'm trusting him today. I want to come home. If there's anybody else needs to stand, I'm going to encourage you to do that. With no one looking around, I'm going to ask those who are standing just to slip out of the seat. There are some people around you standing in the aisles. Just go to them real quick. Just step out right now. Just there are people beside you. If you got a friend with you, tell them, hey, would you come with me? But right now, just slip out. Go ahead, right here. Justin. There's somebody with you. Just hey, grab their hand and say, hey, I need you to go with me. I need courage to go. Anybody else? Praise Jesus. That takes courage. Church family, look at me for a minute. Hey, eight or 10 people just went back. Let's celebrate that this morning. There's some of you in this room today and you've got friends and family members and loved ones that are far from the Lord. Many of them don't know Christ. They need to know they can come back home. And God's just sending you to tell them. So here's what we're gonna do. There are some of you, you got family member friends. We need to get on our knees this morning and pray for them. We've got people that are here willing to pray for you. If you wanna come and pray at the altar, you can. You got people here in the front that would love to pray for you. If you have people in your life that doesn't, they don't know Christ, if you, you want them to know him, come and be prayed for, come and pray. Some of you, you've strayed away from or you know him, but you're living like a prodigal, even though you belong to the Father. And some of you, you need to repent and come home. You, you're saved, but you're not living in relationship and you need to repent of that today. I want you to know we've got people here that wanna help you, encourage you in that or this altar is open for prayer. I'm gonna get you to stand to your feet. I'm gonna pray over you and then we're gonna worship for a few minutes. Father, we ask right now by your Holy Spirit that you would move. Help us be broken over the loss and help us be broken over our sin. And God, we celebrate what you have done, but Lord, I don't think you're done yet. Would you move in Jesus' name, amen.